So good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone from uh, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to this webinar co-presented by Orcus and Foxton. I'm Olivier Poupany, Head of Developer Relations at Orcus, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. We have an exciting agenda today with two sessions. First, Piren Barea, co-founder and CTO of Orcus, will introduce some best practices in microservices orchestration. Then, Tisara Alawala, lead architect at Foxtel, and Abhijit Kotur, principal Java developer at Foxtel, will talk about their journey migrating their existing distributed application to Orcus Conductor. Finally, we'll take a few minutes for Q&A. During the sessions, feel free to post your questions in the little window located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll go over all of them during the Q&A. I also like to inform you that a recording of today's webinar will be shared with you later this week. Okay, time to kick off and learn from one of the creators of Netflix Conductor, Viren Barreya. Viren, up to you. Thanks, Olivier. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks again for joining. Um, so, we are going to write, jump right into it. Um, and you know, before we get started about you know conductor and orchestration and everything, I want to kind of talk about a little bit on the modern um, application architecture and the kind of demands it puts in today's business. Right? Uh, when we think about the modern application architecture and uh, you know what it really means for the business, right? Is first and foremost, it it is supposed to be designed for change, right? Like if you think about your business your business not is not an aesthetic entity, right? It is evolving constantly along with the time, right? Um, and time to market has become more important than ever. Um, the competition has increased both from the traditional companies as well as startups trying to break in into uh, you know, various industries. So you know, velocity at which the new application flows are built um, has to be kind of uh, much higher than you know, what it used to be before. And when you think about operational complexity that it brings together, right? Uh, your architecture has to be able to handle those complexities as well. And you know, lately, one more thing that has come into the picture is kind of around AI, right? Um, everybody is talking about AI and how AI is going to kind of help accelerate some of the innovations that are happening in in various industries. So, now how do you kind of build applications where you know language models are part of your application stack, right? As opposed to just you know something that is more research oriented, and combine all of this together right like in the end what matters the most right like when you think about developers and where they are spending the time right how does the architecture enable them to focus on what matters the most which is essentially in the end driving value to the business but why the modern application architecture is complex um, you know what are the complexities of architecture so let's dig a little bit deeper into it so when we think about the application architecture, it is not just about implementing business logic. Um, you know, when we think about today's architecture, you know, oftentimes we are running things into cloud um, or sometimes even in, you know, in a hybrid cloud environment, right? Including cloud and on-prem or a combination of both. And you have applications which are designed and built uh, by, you know, coordinating across multiple services. You have to kind of manage uh, smart pipes, so to speak, right across the services to ensure that you know the communication is seamless. Um, you are able to handle transactions across the services. You can handle failures, uh, either persistent or transi transient failures. Uh, when you think about a distributed systems architecture, uh, you know all the fallacies of distributed architecture kind of applies here, right? Like network. Um, uh, dependencies, everything, you know, anywhere there could be an issue and your application has to be able to handle those things. And at the same time, the application flows have gotten more complex. So, you know, how do you kind of provide visibility into execution flow, uh, which allows you to kind of detect the failures much faster and, and remediate them, ensuring that your business continues to operate uh, smoothly. And let's not forget about some of the technical complexities as well, right, that it uh, imposes on. Uh, one of them is kind of how do you build and enable resiliency and durability into your application flows? Like, you know, some of your application flows could be running for, you know, days, months, even for years. And, you know, how do you ensure that, like, you know, you have a right infrastructure to maintain the state, something that, you know, you don't have to kind of reinvent all the time with every new application. 
and they are designed for failures right there used to be a time where we used to do this you know annual disaster recovery exercises uh, cloud enforces us to kind of do that on a pretty much daily basis so you know how do you build systems that can you know handle failures you know they are designed for failures rather than you know thinking about failures as an exception scenario and how do you do that uh, with you know increased demands that uh, you know data has put right now you know every application that used to process data you know maybe a few years back has started to process you know um, multiple fold uh, multifold uh, volume so you know the data has increased um, how do you ensure that like you know services are able to auto scale up and down both ways right without breaking the bank and ensuring that like you know you have the right level of um, services there and that's all about building the application but what happens after the application is deployed right it's built and it's running in a production environment there comes the other challenges you know developers move to a different project um, who has the tribal knowledge about how everything works but then now you have support uh, teams who need to understand you know how the applications work uh, you need uh, you have SREs who wants to understand, you know, when the uh, services should be scaled up or down, and the management wants to know about other things around, you know, uh, failures, um, uh, you know, uptime, SLS. Business wants to continue evolving the application, right? They want to keep making tweaks and changes. So let's take an example, right? Um, let's say you are building a simple application that does uh, loan processing, right? A very trivialized example uh, to demonstrate the point that I made. Uh, you typically have, you know, five steps here and I could write these five steps and, you know, wire them up. But I also have to think about other cases, right? What happens if my identity validation service is not responding or has a rate limit imposed? What if my risk scoring model, I want to kind of A-B test with, you know, algorithms versus a machine learning model? What if, you know, something fails halfway down the line? How do I kind of roll back my changes and so forth? So, you know, oftentimes what we end up doing is, you know, we end up putting some sort of message bus and, and, and put together, um, you know, the solution using existing stacks. But where the traditional stacks kind of falls apart and do not solve this problem 100% is, you know, it starts to build what we would like to call it as a distributed monolith. You know, you end up with a situation where you have a single point of failure with message buses where you have the entire routing logic implemented inside the code. So, you know, you know that service A, once it completes processing, puts in the right level of metadata in the message or, you know, has knowledge to call the service B, which means now what happens is if you were to go and ask a question, what does my loan processing application look like? That entire logic is distributed across five different applications or even probably more than that, right? And different code bases. How do I kind of visualize all of these things? that becomes tricky and that's really more important when something doesn't go as planned, right? Like how do I know where things are broken? How do I kind of handle one of scenarios to do repairs and recovery and all of those things? And this was from one of the reports published by Deloitte and in our experience also that when you think about the time that is spent by developers to build all the flows to be more resilient uh, and then handle operations and maintenance after the applications are deployed, 70 or even more than that percent of the time is spent on that work. Um, and probably less than 30% of the time is actually spent on actually writing the business logic. Um, so imagine the amount of time that is kind of gone um, and overhead to just build an application. So is there a better way to kind of solve this problem? And, you know, the simple answer is uh, through orchestration. Orchestration has been around for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, it solves many of the problems that we described. Uh, you know, the advantage of having an orchestrator is that an orchestrator knows about everything. So, you know, it can, it can give you full visual graph of what's happening. It helps you reduce the um, time it takes to identify the issue and, and recover. And more importantly, it helps you handle beyond day zero, scenario, day zero scenarios, right? How do you handle the operational complexity of your applications? This is a quote from one of the articles published by Anderson Horowitz on their uh, thesis about modern transactional stack and talking about workflow engine. So in this talk, essentially we are talking about conductor. Conductor was built uh, by us at Netflix. Uh, we built conductor to solve many of the problems that we described earlier, right? We were 
on a choreography based uh, service um, orchestration or service coordination platform and we started to see you know the complexities and issues that arise uh, with those and that's where we built conductor conductor is a fully distributed so no single point of failure uh, orchestration platform um and given you know it was pretty useful we put it under apache 2.0 license so it's fully open source it's available on github you can search for github and and check it out for yourself um and other advantage of conductor is that it's a fully polyglot system um which means that you now you can write your workflows and code in any of the programming languages um it fully supports all the major languages to be able to write your code uh, in fact a single application with conductor can be built with multiple programming languages so you know you could have a python code that interacts with the machine learning models and ai and java or c sharp code that implements the business logic coming back to orcus uh, we founded orcus um, to bring conductor uh, as a managed service so you know orcus essentially provides fully managed version of conductor with all the enterprise features in all the major clouds including on prem and our goal with orcus is very simple right we want to reduce the business complexity in terms of um, uh, you know building applications that allows you know businesses to go faster with go to market strategy and lower cost of operations but at the same time more importantly help uh, companies run conductor in 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 cloud environments with ease so let's see it in action uh, i'm going to spend the next uh, two or three minutes just giving you a quick overview of how conductor looks like um, so he conductor has essentially two ports uh, portions right as a developer when you are building applications you are using the sdks which are very lightweight completely framework agnostic so you can write your code in, in any of the languages any of the frameworks that you prefer conductor does not impose any particular framework or language onto you so that's how you write the code uh, for all the runtime operations and visualization is where you have your ui that allows you to kind of quickly build a very powerful workflow so i'll show you very quickly here um you know if i were to build a very complex workflow uh like this one here we have a fully visual code editor um that was built as part of conductor that allows you to kind of quickly design um the entire business uh, application process right you can make an uh, you can call an http endpoint which uh, contains your microservice you can do all the http operations you can write a javascript code that does the processing of the metadata or the logic uh, you can have switch cases you know to kind of do conditional processing and implement lightweight uh, decision models into your code you can have parallel processing as a matter of fact conductor one idea where it excels is it can do massive parallel forks right imagine a scenario where you want to process um, all the files uh, for a bad job and you know you have tens of thousands of files that you want to process in parallel conductor can do it uh, little ease and as you build this flow um, you know i can also integrate those things with existing traditional eventing systems like kafka or rabbitmq so you know it is not an island it, it interacts very well with existing services that you have in place and as you can see right i'm changing things you know it already kind of writing the code for me i can check in this code into my repository um, if this is really complex or is fully dynamic i can also write the same code using any of the languages sdk um and when you run the conductor workflows every workflow execution is indexed so you know i can search for things that have failed um i can get quick insight into why they failed like for example here this failed because the remote service gave me 403 um so you know if i have a expired token or a key i can refresh it rerun this with a single api call and my operational flow will continue so that's about conductor um i'm going to hand it over to olivia for the next um session thank over to you olivia thank you viran this is a great introduction to the best practices let's see now how they have been applied at foxtel all right let's continue tisara abijit the floor is yours so we'll uh... <laughs> walk you through the microservices journey that that we uh, 
were going through in Foxtel uh, when it comes to Conductor. Conductor is an orchestration platform that we have been using uh, since a couple of years now, but we had a couple of challenges and most of those challenges were addressed by OK. So we'll be just uh, going through what challenges we faced and what we were using before that and uh, what is the future that we are going to uh, go with OK. So then uh, in agenda, so initially I'll be give a bit of a brief about Foxtel and what we are doing. And we'll go through what we have been using before using the Netflix conductor. So then uh, Abjit will walk through the experience in Netflix conductor and the challenges that we faced. And then uh, finally, uh, I'll briefly go through with the, what are the valuation steps that we have done and what features and things that we are actually using in Ocus conductor. So uh, Foxtel, we are, we are an entertainment company. So we do have a couple of platforms like Chaos Sports and uh, Binge for Movies. And we do have uh, separate news channels called Flash. And uh, those are mainly uh, live streaming, uh, stream-based platforms. And apart from that, we do have uh, Foxtel. Foxtel is a, a pay TV uh, channel. And there are many other products coming in that line. So then uh, we are kind of doing a bit of a new things like uh, aggregated platforms. So there are a couple of things that, that we anticipate to come in future. And primarily our platforms, when it comes to orchestration and the AUKUS uh, area, it, we are, what we mainly doing is we are doing, we are doing processing of videos and it's metadata in a particular central platform uh, to be catered for all the applications. So that is a bit of a background, but we, are, we need uh, AUKUS as a platform. And a uh, bit of about technology, we are primarily using uh, depending on microservices architecture and uh, most of our deployments are on Kubernetes. And uh, yeah, so that is mainly uh, our infrastructure. So uh, I'll quickly hand over to Abhijit to go give a bit of idea about pre-Netflix and the Netflix experience that we were using before Focus. Yeah, over to you Abhijit. Yep. Uh, yeah, Tisara. Uh, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Abhijit. I'm a principal engineer here at Foxtel. I uh, work on the video technologies area. Um, <clears throat> like uh, like Tisara mentioned, we have quite a number of products uh, that we uh, that we support. Um, and uh, uh, and yes, um, so Foxtel as a as an organization uh, had has had a you know. Um, a very natural progression of you know how how things grow right so we we started as, as a you know as a single product and then we kept on adding more and more products and now we have you know a lot of them so naturally we we started with you know you know probably monoliths um and 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 went our way into microservices and so that that's a natural progression um um, so we have we we do support uh, multiple uh, uh, you know uh, processes for the company. We solve a lot of problems. One of the main problems is video processing, um, as well as metadata uh, management of these videos. Right. So the um, as we added more and more and more and more products, we 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 had to uh, build you know separate pipelines to deal with these uh, the videos and their metadata and. The things started getting more and more complicated. Um, so we, what what we did was we we before I head on to the challenges uh, we faced, we'll probably talk a bit about uh, what we did to solve it in the first place. So we we went on and built you know an in house um, kind of a task engine, a task execution engine, which will uh, which will you know uh, execute a series of tasks based on based on uh, you know the current state of the event. Um, and you know, if there are a set number of steps that we have to do to process a video, so we execute them one after the other. But they, they, um, there was there was nothing in the middle to work work out things for this process. So, so if 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 someone wants to look at you know uh, this video coming in, this new movie coming in, where is it? What what you know what part of the flow is it currently sitting in? Is it getting transcoded? Is it getting packaged? There was no visibility because this was all uh, event-driven thingy, and uh, which proved to be quite difficult because our operation guys they wanted they wanted to know what's happening. So, um, 
trouble shooting was another problem we had because if something goes wrong somewhere again the same problem um uh, so, you know we needed we needed an engineer to to actually trouble shoot try to find out where exactly what failed right and uh, it was um you know it's like a vicious circle right the more and more uh, s- systems you add the more and more microservices you add you know troubleshooting and maintaining becomes more and more expensive to do and as well as you know technically challenging for you know ops guys so that is um that is uh, one of the one of the stages where we realized maybe you know uh, choreography uh, probably tisara if i can ask you to uh, move to the uh, next um, next page yeah so so what we were do- doing was you know traditional uh, choreography right which was uh, we realized maybe it's not the best way to to deal with things each have their own pros and cons but uh, in our case we needed we needed something central something uh, which you know gives us um, yeah uh, you know um, a, a whole picture of what's happening uh, something using which we can control things you know um, and you know it has a, is has a ui as well and stuff like that so that's where we uh, we we decided to uh, you know try out uh, a different uh, you know uh, methodology i would say so we 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 the task based engine which we built actually it still works there's there's quite a few uh, use cases which it still currently solves in our organization it's it's not like it's a throwaway or whatever uh but but yeah the main one of the the main pipelines that we have uh video processing metadata processing you know delivering um uh delivering content to our playback servers for uh, for linear channels so all, all all of this stuff we have uh, adopted the orchestration uh, ideology uh, over choreography um and uh, and yeah that is when we picked up netflix conductor right um um we uh, we've had um we've had multiple uh, you know workflows multiple <laughs> parts of the company as well use netflix conductor to solve many problems uh, and um uh, there there are quite number few you know benefits that we saw when we moved to uh, conductor uh, like i mentioned all the cons i mentioned when i was talking about choreography were like solved when we moved to um uh, conductor right because it had it, it had a nice ui um um uh and it had all those you know retry features and all of that right so tisara if i can uh, um request you to move to the next next page yeah so yeah so it 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 gave us it gave us one of the main things it gave us was you know uh, operational convenience like how it is mentioned over there right so you 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 can see what's going on um the other thing is that the, the ideology of orchestration right so you your your services they don't they don't need to be um uh, they don't they can be as dumb as they can uh, which then meant they can be you know reused in any multiple other workflows so so it kind of helped us uh, with code reuse you know make uh, you know microservices more more and more dumb so that they can be plugged into multiple places and 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 all the stuff like that and and even the even reusing parts of the functionality of the of the the worker logic itself into multiple workflows as well was another thing which we noticed so um it helped us in quite a few ways and also when i said operational we have we have ops team maintaining you know these um um these failed workflows and stuff so they can easily go and you know click restart and try to see what's happening it's all in the ui it's in the logs we can set what went wrong so it it helped us um um a lot initially in the initial days um and one thing i would yeah definitely want to mention is separation of workflow execution the business logic which decides which orchestrates versus our core backend uh, you know platform services because we need the services to be uh, service not to be very fat they they need to be very lean uh, all the logic was then moved out of the services and what's put in on the conductor or the workflow uh, orchestration layer which uh, which yeah which helped us you know make our systems clean as well so uh tisarak again if i can request you to go to the next um thing yeah so um yes of course with with every system comes problems so um one of the main things uh we had um uh, the, the issue we had with conductor was uh, we, uh, we 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 were maintaining conductor ourselves in the sense we did fork off uh, a very old version of conductor uh, but we had to um uh, we we faced some problems uh, with with locking and uh, you know transaction the how how it handles transaction for which uh, 
some of our senior engineers actually had to do some uh, some slight tweaks uh, which also meant uh, you know we were out of sync with what uh, you know uh, what conductor was going at so we were actually never and we with 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 you know the number of products we were working on we never really found the time to keep up with the latest versions of conductor right so um because of that we were lagging behind uh, we were still running a very old instance old version of conductor uh, which had um, a lot of other issues as well and with any orchestration platform um though though you know it it centralizes everything but if the orchestrator itself dies then then it it pretty much kills the system right because uh, whereas in an event driven thingy if uh, or if certain one of the consumers die it doesn't really kill the whole thing so so that was one of the main problems as well because we we were maintaining our own conductor instances um um they were not very reliable um the, we did not have uh, you know um um enough we did not pay enough attention to uh, keep them upgraded you know keep looking at their health and blah and blah though we had kubernetes and uh, all of that but but yeah so we we lacked uh, slight slightly in that and uh, and yeah community uh, bug fixes um, we were not able to pull them so uh, any smaller bugs we still had to live with them um, and one another main thing was uh, um, uh, the lack of auth right like con conductor doesn't really give authentication um, uh, by out of the box so uh, anyone can just go in conductor and restart a workflow which we I mean, there's this pros of having a UI and then there are cons of having a UI, right? So this is more like that. Um, and scheduling was another problem because we, uh, you know, in some of our cases we have, uh, you know, we have, we want to execute certain workflows on a particular schedule. Uh, conductor out of the box doesn't support that. So we had to use some other tool. We used uh, Airflow for that. But yeah, some other tool which manages the schedule and keeps triggering these workflows uh, time and now, right? So, um yeah, so so we uh, we we <laughs> as we grew, we ended up solving certain problems, which took us to a certain level. We actually were able to manage multiple products with our own instances of conductor. But at that point, newer problems started to appear, right? So that is when um, um, that is when we started looking for alternate options, and uh, um, and yeah, I'll I'll hand it over back to uh, Thisara, uh, who can take us through the options. Sorry. So to solve those challenges, we actually had. So we have evaluated a few other options, mainly Netflix conductor V3. We got to know that V3 has more bug fixes and uh, more, more. It, it totally has a, a, a completely new UI and improved UI. And there are a lot of uh, fix, uh, things that, that have been corrected compared to the previous version. And the other thing that uh, we, uh, evaluated is AWS step functions. Step functions is AWS based uh, implementation, but uh, the main challenge with that is we we already uh, get used to conductor. It is kind of baked into our our environment, developers and all our implementations. But when we look at at uh, step function, it is mainly a, a lambda based implementation. So we have to think of a totally different architectural uh, implementation style and the serverless implementation for that. So that's the main reason we didn't uh, uh, go with step functions. And since we already known uh, uh, about Netflix Conductor V3, so we did a bit of extensive evaluation on V3 compared to the version that we were using. I would like to uh, point out a few things that we have noticed in uh, Conductor V3. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, so a lot of bug fixes were fixed. and But the major problem was it was way ahead uh, compared to the Conductor version that we were maintaining. So then we were not able to merge the code at all. It was not practical because as I remember, we had about 400 uh, merge conflicts. So it is not possible. And the other thing is, uh, other option we were thinking is having a totally different V3 deployment pipeline. So then the the other problem raised related to that is that we wanted to make sure all the internal fixes that we have done is in V3. So it will be a bit of a uh, high effort consuming QA and they, uh, uh, when we're looking at from that angle because 
there's no one uh, literally taking care of uh, v3 from from uh, external perspective because it's mainly community maintained version so then uh, we found out while we are doing that evaluation there's a particle ocus really provides a managed service so we have evaluated uh, most of their uh, practices and the fixes that they have done, their features and most of the things. Uh, I'd like to highlight a few things that we actually gained from uh, going into Ocus. Mainly, we don't want to maintain a pipeline uh, for the build and deployment of conductors. So that is one thing that we had to maintain. So we had a couple of uh, conductor instances. Mainly, as Abhijit uh, mentioned, we had some concurrency and uh, transaction locking issues. To reduce the load, we had to use multiple number of deployments. So the, it ends up creating multiple number of pipelines. So we had to maintain multiples. So then uh, with OKIS, we don't need to maintain any pipeline because it's already managed by them. So they have two different versions, uh, which is called uh, something that they maintain. And the other thing is they come and deploy Orcus within uh, one of our AWS space that 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 they we uh, prefer to them. So we are using the second option, which is called the customer hosted version. So we have uh, we have the Orcus deployment within our our uh, area and within our network space. So we give only access for maintenance and uh, whenever whenever they want to access our environment only. So that is one of the plus thing that we have gained. And the other thing is, uh, since we do not want to do any bug fixes, so pipeline maintenance, our developers and the QA teams have more time to spend on business features. So that is one other gain. And from the cost saving perspective, uh, we are still running both the platforms parallel. So once we switch to Ocus, we can uh, shut down most of the uh, old conductor instances that we are maintaining. So it will cost more, uh, it will save more cost on infrastructure perspective. So uh, giving a bit of a environment, uh, what, what environments we do use for dev and test, we use a preview environment. So which is, the OKC is having their own Docker image. And we do have one non prod shared environment. So we are using a particular cluster type called standard cluster type that they, are, they have given to us. And on production environment, we do have two flavors of uh, OKC. One is the standard cluster type that I mentioned to you you earlier, which we are using in non-prod. And the other one, other thing is uh, IO optimized cluster type. So it is, we are, the IO optimized one, we are actually using for the synchronous load. Things like uh, custom onboarding and sign up, where we cannot tolerate any, any delays of executing the workflows, but for the asynchronous workflows, like metadata processing, video processing for a couple of minutes, we can actually tolerate on uh, workflow delays. And, uh, Few other features that we actually uh, asked Orcus to have. One, one thing is the conductor gateway. Because when looking at those clusters, the, the, those clusters are a bit large. So we wanted to have a particular way of uh, splitting those clusters and sharing across multiple teams because uh, mainly considering cost and the resource sharing because we don't want to run uh, resources just without doing any consumption. So the main purpose of Conductor Gateway is to decouple the direct cluster access from microservices. That is one other aspect of the gateway as well. So once we request that uh, that feature from them, so they actually came up with a brilliant uh, implementation. So this is one one uh, we should give a plus point for that. And the other thing is role-based access control. So before we did not have any role-based access control, as Abhijit mentioned, so anyone can go into the production and restart a workflow. It's a bit of uh, dangerous. So in with the role-based access control in Ocus, we are able to identify a group of workflows using a particular tag. So we can define uh, differ different roles and roles can be assigned to tags. So that's how we actually split uh, the cluster with multiple number of workflow domains. And the other thing is they have uh, inbuilt scheduler. We actually used uh, for a couple of occasions this, but in future we'll be using it uh, for mainly extensively we'll be using it because we wanted to get rid of uh, maintaining uh, airflow for scheduled workflows because it's no point of maintaining another language and uh, 
it just to trigger the workflow since we are having this feature within Opus. And the other thing that we are hoping to use in future is a Kafka task type because we have a lot of uh, Kafka consumers and the publishers within our uh, environment. So if the workflow task can publish and consume a particular message from Kafka, so then we don't need to have separate microservices deployed. So it will save effort from uh, developers and especially from infrastructure perspective, it is one thing that we are hoping to use in future. Other thing that we should uh, uh, highlight is mainly the improved GUI. So user interface has been drastically improved. So it is one, one good thing that we actually noticed. And then uh, we do have few uh, suggested value additions. So those, these are actually they they already in in uh, okay, so in, in uh, development. A uh, few UI improvements like in subtask drill downs, and uh, in scheduler, a couple of uh, if you can have a particular option to execute a particular pre task, so that will be something uh, value addition for our business as well as I, I think as a focus it will be value addition for them as well. So this is something that. Uh, we thought will be uh, value added. And I'll hand over to Abhijit uh, since uh, from the development perspective, what, what experience and what, what uh, feeling that they have with the new platform compared to the uh, community ver maintained version that we have been using. Abhijit, what do you? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I mean, it has been, it has been a, um, a great step up for us because um, like, like the, one of the things that you touched upon is uh, improved GUI um and um the improvements in searching as well because one of the problems we had was with the number of uh workflow executions um uh the search was getting impacted with the with the version of conductor we were uh we were using uh and um so far i haven't really seen anything like that on orcus it's it was it's it's as fast as it was on the day one so it's a big win for us because uh, a lot of times we want to go and find out what uh, how a particular video got processed and what what all parameters it used. And we want to, you know, also look up historical processing. Like let's say something happened six months ago. We want we still want to search and look it up. So so that that has uh, improved a lot. Authentication authorization, of course. And um, um and also one one thing I want to highlight is um is all the task executions they have um uh, uh they they show if we configure retries, they show every retry uh, and what happened with that retry. So it, it we can even view every retries logs and stuff, which is which is pretty cool because um, because most of the times you know first retry fails, second retry works, and and we want to know what happened previously. So all that is clearly visible. So so these are there are actually many things, but um, you know a couple of things that came to my mind. But one thing I would like to have is um, the the scheduler, which is actually which is by itself is a great um, uh, functionality. Uh, but if it can, you know, uh, do like um, um, if, if it has a feature to uh, uh, do some pre checks, like um, uh, let's say if a workflow needs to be triggered, uh, let's say it has a precondition to be met. Uh, currently, what we're having to do is we have the first task of the workflow to do the uh, precondition. If the precondition fails or if the condition isn't met, right? So we just have we have to, you know, do a straight line to end the workflow, uh, which is which can be avoided if the scheduler itself can, you know, do a some sort of a script execute. I, I will not say the word script, but some sort of a execution, which will actually determine the precondition and only then trigger the workflow, right? So that that way the workflow looks clean is one. Secondly, there won't be as many um, uh, executions of the workflow, right? Because let's say pre the condition meets only once or twice a day. And if you are running this, Ten times a day, then there will be eight executions, which will be, uh, which will, which would have, which which can be avoided, right? So, um, um, yeah, that's that's one thing I can think of. But I'm sure uh, because we we just started using Orkies, um, I'm sure um, down the line we'll 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 probably and request a few more, um, and and the team has been very courteous about that, and they have been helping us fixing it um, straight away. So, so yeah, so a big thanks for that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I think uh, we are parallel running uh, both the platforms, as I mentioned earlier. So then probably end of this year, we'll be moving to uh, completely into Orcus platform. So then uh, 
will be extensively using those features. So, so far, uh, it is all good. So we uh, are getting great support and uh, thank you for that. And yeah, so that's about it. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Viren. Thank you all. Um, Olivia, I think this is the time for some q and I think we have a few questions uh, on the chat. Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, so let's see what are the questions. Uh, first one is, can we have services developed by different teams in different languages orchestrated in the same workflow, same in capital? So I think it's important. Yes, so the answer is correct. Uh, yes, uh, you can have a workflow that contains uh, tasks written in different languages. And we also recommend that that allows you to kind of leverage the best language for the task at hand, right? So, you know, if you are invoking a machine learning model or doing something with the data, maybe you have a task written in Python, your business logic is probably implemented in Java or C Sharp. These days, some folks are also using Golang, but it connector is fully polyglot from that perspective. Great, thanks. Uh, let's see the second one. Oh, that's one is interesting. How long does it take to deploy a workflow from the open source version of Conductor to Orcus Conductor? Um, it's plug and play. So, you know, take for example, let's say you have an open source conductor running, you have a bunch of workflows, you can just, you know, store them in Orcus and get started, uh, no changes required. Uh, because Orcus is basically open source conductor, right? Like we have added few enterprise features, but it is still at the core conductor open source. Another one, is the UI able to embed implemented into an existing React application? So I'll give you a short answer, which is the answer is yes. Like you, you can, actually implement it. Uh, we are actually working on React components that allows you to kind of just embed only the graph. Uh, for now, we can actually put in a iframe and embed that, but yes. Oh, a simple one. How do I get started? <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I have put in kind of a bunch of QR codes here. So, you know, uh, we have kind of few ways to get started. One is, you know, you can definitely check out the GitHub repository. Uh, but we have a free playground. So you go and go to play.orcus.io. Uh, it's completely free, uh, available for everyone to try it out. So, you know, you can easily build your workflows um, and, uh, you know, start playing around with it. Um, All right, time to wrap up then. Uh, again, on behalf of Orcus and Foxtel, I'd like to thank everyone for your time today. I hope you found this webinar insightful. I also like to thank our speakers, Viren, Tessara, and Abhijit. Thank you guys for sharing with, her, with our audience today. Have a great day, everyone, and see you at the next webinar.